One of the kitchen helpers has stolen into the dining room to listen to the talk instead of doing his task. Reproving him, Gurdjieff said, Your task is now in kitchen. If you neglect life tasks, you will neglect this work. You must try to do everything well in all circumstances. Help is given to those who help themselves in the right direction. By striving to do everything well, we shall help the work, the teacher and the group. I could not catch all that followed, but I heard, Remember what I write in Beelzebub. If take, then take. Whenever I do anything, I do a lot of it. I returned to New York in November and worked with the groups through the winter and early spring. The summer following, 1926, I was again at the Priory. A small pipe organ had been put in the salon and every day Hartman played Gurdjieff's music. Hearing it on the organ gave one a fresh understanding of it. Gurdjieff composed many new pieces this summer and autumn, which were arranged by Hartman, among them music for Easter and Christmas. The holy affirming, holy denying, holy reconciling and hymns from a truly great temple. Almost every afternoon and evening the music was played. All who could would leave their work, go to the salon and sit quietly. At weekends, when there was usually a number of people, Hartman played many pieces. Some of them were so moving as to be almost unbearable and the tears would stream involuntarily down our cheeks. One had to remember oneself with all one's might in order not to have to go out. Hartman said that he himself found some of the pieces almost too difficult to play. One of the pieces consisted of slow and solemn chords of the most divine harmony and in the overtones one could hear a sort of joyful singing as of the voice of a seraph. I have never heard anything like these hymns of Gurdjieff except perhaps some of the very early church music such as can be heard in Notre Dame and some of that of Bach who at times touches the higher emotional centre. Listening to the music, one could observe in oneself three different processes proceeding simultaneously, one in the mental centre, another in the emotional, and still another in the instinctive centre. One was reminded of Madame Vivitaskaskia in the story of Prince Lubavitsky's in Tales of Remarkable Men. She was travelling with Gurdjieff's party in Central Asia, they had stayed at a monastery and had heard some music which had aroused great interest and moved them deeply. The next day, when they started out, they asked her why her finger was bound up. It was that damn music, she said. The effect on her had been so powerful that she had not been able to sleep. She had gnawed her finger, puzzling over the effect it had had on her. There had been a reading from Beelzebub's Towers in the chapter on purgatory, in the salon after lunch in the English dining room. In answer to a remark from someone, Gurdjieff began to speak about silly angels and said that if a man works on himself and purges himself of undesirable elements, he will be better than an angel, a being with more understanding and experience. One of us, who perhaps had had a glass of almanac too much, asked a question and began to wiseacre a bit. Gurdjieff, turning on him, reproved him for not trying to understand, which, by association, brought to my mind a passage in the Pistius Sophia. Andrew says to Jesus, Don't be angry with me, but have patience and reveal to me the mystery. It is hard for me and I do not understand. Jesus said, Well, ask and I will explain clearly. It is a matter of wonder to me, Andrew said, how men in the world and in the body of this matter, if they come out of the world, will pass through these firmaments and rulers, lords, gods, great invisibles, and enter into the light kingdom. Jesus said angrily, How long must I put up with you? Are you so ignorant that you still do not understand? Don't you know that you and angels and archangels, the gods and lords and rulers, and the great ones of the emanation of the light and their whole glory, are all made out of the same paste, matter and substance. You are all of the same mixture, but the great ones, in purifying themselves, have not suffered nor been in affliction. But you, you are the refuge of all these 
and you suffer and are in affliction through being poured into different kinds of bodies in the world. Now, Andrew, and all of you, when by your sufferings you have purified yourselves, you will go on high to the light kingdom, and if you reach the region of the great Lord of the light, you will be revered among them because you are the refuge of their matter and have become more purified than all of them. This also helps to explain Gurdjieff's constantly telling us that we were Murdered de la Murd. Attar in the Conference of the Birds says, When the soul was joined to the body, it was part of the all. Never has there been so marvellous a talisman. The soul had a share of that which is high, and the body a share of that which is low. It was formed of a mixture of heavy clay and pure spirit. By this mixing, man must become the most astonishing of the mysteries. The Sufi poet Jalala says, If thou art good enough to be a man, thou art too good for an angel. Adam's race of white and dust are shrines that angels worship at. Dante, before he ascends the mountain of purgatory, is told that his face must be cleansed of the tears he shed in hell, and Virgil washes his face with dew. The penitent's first duty in going to purgatory is cheerfulness. Having seen his sin and acknowledged it, he must put it out of his mind and not wallow in self-pity and self-reproach, which are forms of egotism. A pupil, speaking of the difficulty of arousing people's interest in Gurdjieff's ideas, refer to Lucien's Charon. Charon says, And although their lives are short as leaves, Hermes, you see how they struggle with one another to get power and honour and possessions, in spite of their having to leave it all behind and be doomed to take our ferry with only an obol for the fare. Now that we are on these heights, don't you think it would be good if I were to shout out a loud warning and tell them to cease their useless toil? and to strive to keep the fact of death ever before them. I would cry, O oh, you foolish men, why do you strive after these vain things? Stop this toiling and moiling. Are you going to live forever? These honours and riches are not lasting, nor can you take them with you. You will go out naked, leaving your houses and lands to others. Don't you think that if I were to shout this to them, it would help them to exist more wisely? Hermes. Don't you see what their abnormal way of living has brought them to? Even if you used an augur, you could not unstop their ears. They would have plugged them with the wax Ulysses and his friends used against the siren songs and would not hear if you shouted until you burst. What the river leaf does in your underworld is done on earth by ignorance. Very few there refrain from stopping their ears and so are able to understand the reality of things. A Persian proverb says, The wise man understands the fool, for he himself was once a fool. But the fool does not understand the wise man, since he never was wise. And there is another Persian saying, Up, up, only a little life is left. The road before you is long, and you are immersed in illusion. Gurdjieff often spoke about the need to repair the past not to dwell on it and indulge in useless self-reproach, but to feel remorse of conscience. Remorse in the Middle English language is iron bite of inwit, the again bite of in-knowing, of understanding. Compare the French remordre, bite again, the opposite of self-calming. He said to a pupil, Past joys are useless to a man in the present. They are as last year's snows which leave no trace by which they can be remembered. Only the imprints of conscious labour and voluntary suffering are real and can be used in the future for obtaining good. On another occasion he said, What a man sows, he reaps. The future is determined by the actions of the present. The present, be it good or bad, is the result of the past. It is the duty of man to prepare for the future every moment of the present, and to write what has been done wrong. This is the law of destiny. Blessed be the prime source of all laws. To someone who complained that nothing went ever as it logically should be, he said, every satisfaction is accompanied by a non-satisfaction. 
In speaking of the need to help one another, he said, We usually know others better than they know themselves. Therefore, mutual help is necessary and profitable. But often, self-love and self-pride prevent our profiting when we are told of our faults and weaknesses, for we often deny or try to justify ourselves. In all our actions, we should strive to attain that which is useful for others and agreeable to ourselves. He often spoke about the unlucky sometimes becoming the lucky. Appropriate, Lao Tzu relates, an old man lived with his son in an ancient disused fort on a hill. One day his horse, on which he depended, strayed and was lost. His neighbours came and sympathised with him on his bad luck. How do you know this is bad luck? he asked. Some days later his horse appeared, together with some wild horses, which the man and his son trained. His neighbours this time congratulated him on his good luck. How do you know this is good luck? asked the man. And as it happened, his son, while riding one of the horses, was thrown and became permanently lame. His neighbours condoled with him and again spoke about his ill luck. How do you know this is ill luck? he asked. Not long after, war broke out and the son, because of his lameness, could not go. We have been speaking among ourselves about electricity and magnetism, or animal magnetism, and how some people have more animal magnetism than others. When one of us asked Gurdjieff about this, he said, Man has two substances in him, the substance of active elements of the physical body and the substance made of the active elements of astral matter. These two, by mixing, form a third substance. This third substance is a mixed substance. It gathers in certain parts of a man and forms an atmosphere around him as an atmosphere forms round a planet. The atmospheres round planets are continually gaining or losing substance because of other surrounding planets. Man is surrounded by other men as planets are surrounded by other planets. When, within certain limits, two atmospheres meet, and if the atmospheres are sympathetic, a contact is made between them and lawful results occur. Something flows. The quantity of atmosphere remains the same, but the quality changes. A man who has worked on himself and understands can control his atmosphere. It is like electricity and has positive and negative parts, and one part can be made to flow like a current. Everything has positive and negative electricity. In man, wishes and non-wishes are positive and negative. Astral material is always opposed by physical matter. In ancient times, priests, real priests, understood the use of magnetism and were able to cure disease by blessing with the hands. Some priests laced their hands on a sick person. Others could cure at a short distance, others at long distances. A priest was a man who possessed the third, the mixed substance, and could use it to cure others. A priest was a magnetizer. Jesus Christ was a magnetizer. Sick people are those who are deficient in this mixed substance, magnetism or life. This mixed substance can be seen if concentrated. An aura, halo or nimbus is real. It can still be seen by some in certain holy places and certain churches and sometimes around certain people. Mesmer rediscovered the use of this substance. Someone asked, How can we use this substance? Gurdjieff, To be able to use it, you must first have it in yourselves. To gain it, it is the same as with gaining attention, by conscious labour and voluntary suffering. That is, by doing small things voluntarily, consciously. Begin by doing some small thing you wish to do and are now not able to do. By making this effort and doing, you will acquire magnetism. Gurdjieff spoke about learning to play roles, but one should begin with something quite small and simple. He himself was a master of the technique. With officials, for example, he could play the role of a simple man, almost devoid of intelligence, and so disarm them. Once, two psychologists from England came to the Priory on their way to a conference in Geneva, presumably to get Gurdjieff's views on the various schools. They were acquainted with Ruspensky, Gurdjieff gave them a wonderful lunch, but every time they asked him a question, he turned it aside with a joke. After lunch, he took them for a walk round the grounds and back to the study house, 
cracking jokes and behaving like an eccentric. I was standing by the door and he asked me, what a day is today? I said, Tuesday. He turned to them with a smile. Fancy, he say Tuesday and all the time I think it Wednesday. And he led them into the study house. The men were bewildered. When they left, his attitude changed. Now, he said, they will leave me in peace to pursue my aim. Another aspect of Gurdjieff was his ability on the one hand to make himself almost invisible and on the other to make himself appear like one of the Rishis, blazing with energy and radiance. When visitors were being shown round the grounds, they would sometimes pass him with only a glance, like an American who was talking to me about what a wonderful man Mr Gurdjieff must be and that he would like to meet him. Just then, Gurdjieff passed by and went into the house. That is Mr Gurdjieff, I said. Wall, he replied, isn't that queer? I spoke to him in the grounds and thought he was the gardener. In ordinary life, people play roles unconsciously. Gurdjieff played them consciously, and those who worked closely with him usually knew when he was playing a role. In A Letter to a Dervish, he wrote... The sign of a perfected man and his particularity in ordinary life must be that in regard to everything happening outside of him, he is able to, and can, as a worthy action, perform to perfection externally the part corresponding to the given situation, but at the same time never blend or agree with it. In my youth, I too, as you more or less know, being convinced of the truth of this, worked on myself very much for the purpose of attaining such a blessing as I thought predetermined by heaven. And after enormous efforts and continuous rejection of nearly everything deserved in ordinary life, I finally reached a state when nothing from the outside could really touch me internally. And so, far as acting was concerned, I brought myself to such a perfection as was never dreamed of by the learned people of ancient Babylon for the actors on the stage. Gurdjieff never let pass anything that we did or said in moments of forgetfulness. If he was present when it happened, he took it up at once. And if he were told about the incident, he would wait for an opportunity to make us eat dog in the presence of others. I had made a silly, flippant remark to someone appropriate of Gurdjieff. Three days later, I found myself in the study house, sitting on the rich carpets with himself, Storgenval, Hartman and some others. We were drinking coffee. He said to me, Repeat what you said to so-and-so the other day. At once I realised how silly I'd been in a moment of forgetfulness. A tremendous resistance came over me against acknowledging that I'd acted as one without responsibility. He again asked me, smiling, but I kept silent and suffered. Then he said, If you do this, former Hartman, she'll play you any piece you wish. After a struggle, I repeated it overcome with humiliation. Gurdjieff smiled and said, What you wish? I said, a fragment of an Essene hymn. He nodded to Hartman, who went to the piano and played it. This incident hit me so hard in the solar plexus that I never forget it. Once, in a harassed state, when I was trying to cope with a situation which involved myself, Gurdjieff and three women, I asked him, why do you let them stay here when they say such things about you, when they oppose you in every way? He said, you not understand. They do not say what they really feel. Men are logical, women not logical. You make mistake because you expect a woman to react as a man would react. Men are men, women are women. Another thing, sometimes necessary to have people around you that you dislike. If people are always pleasant, you like them. No incentive for work. These women give you very good opportunity for work, and I also must make effort. As usual, Gurdjieff was right. It was lack of understanding on my part. His patience and his work made very useful pupils of them. In the Pilgrim's Progress, Christian and Faithful meet Talkative, who proceeds to discuss with them the mysteries of religion. At last, Faithful says to Talkative, If a man have all knowledge, he may yet be nothing and so be no child of God. When Christ said to the disciples, Do you know all these things? And they answered yes. He added, Blessed are you if you do them. For there is a knowledge that is not attained by doing. A man may know like an angel, yet be no Christian. 
There is knowledge that rests on the bare speculation of things, and there is knowledge that is accompanied with the grace of faith and love, which puts a man upon doing even the will of God from the heart. Give me understanding, and I shall keep thy law. Ye, I shall observe it with my whole heart. Psalm one hundred and nineteen thirty four. Talkative, angry, leaves them and goes back. During this summer, Gurdjieff was making notes on the chapters about Ashiata Shirmash, and one evening he began to talk to us, especially to Araj, about conscious faith, hope and love, particularly the last. Gurdjieff then went to his room, as he often did, early to rest, sometimes inviting people to talk. On this occasion he told Araj to come. The next day Araj said to me, Read this. I talked with Gurdjieff last night for a long time, and afterwards I went to my room and wrote till four this morning. This is the result. It was the draft of an essay on love, the three kinds of love affecting the relations between men and women. It was the most interesting thing I had ever read on this universal subject, and I read it and reread it. It was published later in the Atlantic Monthly. When Araj returned to England, he wanted it published there, and as no publisher would take it, I paid for its publication in book form in London. Since then, it has run into several editions. It is a gem, though, for most, an almost unattainable idea. This short essay, apart from what is written in Beelzebub's Tales, which is in a different category, is the only modern published exposition of the possibility of attaining a state of conscious love between men and women. Even those who are happily married can learn something from it. In reply to a question about the second food, air, Gurdjieff said, There are two parts to air, evolving and involving. Only the involving part can vivify the eye. At present, this involving part serves only for general cosmic purposes. Only when you shall have in yourselves a conscious wish will you be able to assimilate this, for you, good part of air, which comes from the prime source. In order to be able to assimilate the involving part of air, you should try to realise your own significance and the significance of those around you. You are mortal and some day will die. He on whom your attention rests is your neighbour. He also will die. Both of you are non-entities. At present, most of your suffering is suffering in vain. It comes from feelings of anger, jealousy and resentment towards others. If you acquire data always to realise the inevitability of their death and your own death, you will have a feeling of pity for others and be just towards them, since their manifestations which displease you are only because you or someone has stepped on their corns, or because your own corns are sensitive. At present, you cannot see this. Try to put yourself in the position of others. They have the same significance as you. They suffer as you do, and like you, they will die. Only if you always try to sense this significance until it becomes a habit, whenever your attention rests on anyone, only then will you be able to assimilate the good part of air and have a real eye. Every man has wants and desires which are dear to him and which he will lose at death. From realising the significance of your neighbour when your attention rests on him, then he will die. Pity for him and compassion towards him will arise in you and finally you will love him. Also by doing this constantly, real faith, conscious faith, will arise in some part of you and spread to other parts and you will have the possibility of knowing real happiness. Because from this faith, objective hope will arise, hope of a basis for continuation. Gurdjieff worked as usual every day on Beelzebub's towels, rewriting and revising, working as usual in cafes and at the priory, sometimes indoors, sometimes in the garden, sometimes with people round him, sometimes alone. When chapters were read out in the salon after dinner, he would watch the expressions on our faces. He had began to draft the chapter on America, and if an American visitor turned up, he would have parts of the chapter read, and always he would begin to laugh during certain passages. We also would join in the laughter, 
although most of us were never sure what he was laughing at. I suspect that it was at ourselves. In the bookless library one day he said, Araj, why do English and especially Americans say all right even when it isn't all right? Araj replied, yes, when everything goes wrong we say all right, what do we do now? Salesman thought this very funny and began to joke about the expression all right and Gurdjieff said, I will use this in my chapter on America. When nothing's right then all right. When a chapter was being read, he would often tell the reader to pause and the reader would put a comma at the place, hence the sometimes strange punctuation in the English translation. Often he would ask about a passage or a chapter. What does it make you feel? The emphasis being on feel, never what do you think of it? There were frequent disputes about the use of the right word. Gurdjieff would have it the city Samalias, the reader would say that is not English, we say the city of Samalias. Do you say the man of Smith? asked Gurdjieff. No, the man Smith. Then why not the city Samalias? Because it isn't English. Then English is idiot language, rejoined Gurdjieff. He wanted to make the expression the next day definite. The reader said, you must say the very next day. But next day is next day. Why very? That's how we say it. With a quick movement, he stroked his moustache, then made a gesture with his hand, which was meant to express, even for me, the English language defies all rules of logical expression. On another occasion, the expression occurred to see if it would not be possible. He said, I mean, to see if it would be possible. The reader said, that is what it does mean. Gurdjieff said, not possible means impossible. I mean possible. Is it not possible sometimes to think straight in your language? The strange names in Beelzebub are combinations of words or roots or parts of words in various language, symbols to make the reader ponder and reflect. A constant balance was maintained between objective ideas and the needs of everyday life. The need of money, for example, and a great deal was needed to carry on the work. It was difficult for some to understand that money, for Gurdjieff, was money for the work. People revealed a great deal about themselves in their attitude to money and in the way they gave it. Gurdjieff's attitude made it difficult, for with money, as with other things, he never did as others did. When people had made an effort to get money for him, they were sometimes surprised to find that he would spend it on a large party or a trip, though he never, except for occasional clothes, spent it on himself. His disposal of money, as I have said, was often determined by the attitude of the giver. A pupil from New York, a rather mean but well-to-do woman, gave him a cheque for about $50, but written in francs to make it appear larger. The same evening, after dinner in the salon, he, with Mrs X sitting by him, had all the children brought in. Beginning with the youngest, he distributed the francs among them to the amount of exactly 500 to other pupils, he gave him money. Gurdjieff would give it back and say, You keep, you need it now. Perhaps later you will have money to give. He was always helping people who really needed money. You are naive about money, he said to me. Most people are. But you are also a miser. Not only in money, but in everything. While you remain naive, everyone will take advantage of you. If a person is nice to you, you will give money from feeling and regret it afterwards. Same in your business. If you are easy with people from weakness, they will not respect you but take advantage of you in dollar business and in other things. You must learn to be, how you say in English, cunning. Cunning, I suggested. Yes, cunning, but for a good aim and in the right way. He constantly reminded us that we must do everything well that we must always be ready to adapt ourselves to changing circumstances, to be resourceful and to learn to be able always to turn a setback or a disadvantage to our own use, to regard life as a gymnasium in which one could use conditions for the development of will. Consciousness and individuality to learn to be not ordinary but extraordinary. 
The extraordinary man, he said, is just and indulgent to the weaknesses of others, and he depends on the resources of his own mind, which he has acquired by his own efforts. As I say, when he was speaking to me, I felt that I could do, but always there was the inertia of the organism to contend with, its wish to take things easily, to talk instead of to do, the tendency to become caught up in outside life, to go with the stream of things. It is so easy to drift. In life, once effort ceases, the movement is downwards. This has been known from remote times. When Aeneas Prez prayed before his descent into the underworld, the prophetess answers, Seed of the blood divine, man of Troy, Anchise's son, the descent to Avernus is not hard. Every night and every day, black Pluto's door stands open wide. But to retrace your steps and return to the upper air, that is the task, that is work. The golden bow, the method, is necessary. In the late autumn of 1926, I was again in New York. In December, an offer was made for my book business and in a few weeks it was sold and passed out of my hands. With some surprise, I recalled that less than four years previously I'd been afraid that if I became interested in the Gurdjieff system, I might not be able to carry out the project that then seemed so dear to me, and now it has slipped away with not only no regret but even with relief. I saw how that from my childhood I'd been so identified with books that I'd almost worshipped them. I had been a bibliolitris, a bibliomane, a bibliophile, a bibliopolis, and even a bibliotaphis. Now a feeling of thankfulness pervaded me for being cured of the book disease. I called to mind what Gurdjieff had said to me during the previous summer in the train from Paris to Fontainebleau. I and another man were talking animatedly about first editions and rare books. Gurdjieff listened and then said to me, I tell you, time will come when not one single book will be sold in England. If you still wish to sell books, better for you to sell pornographic books than what you sell now. A naive young man who was with us took this quite literally and later spread the story that Gurdjieff had said that the time was not far off when no books would be published in England and he advised one of his pupils to sell pornographic books to make money. Of course, what Gurdjieff said was meant for me alone. It was one of his characteristic cartoons, a caricature even, of speech, to shock me into becoming aware of my identification with books as things in themselves. Though I began to discover, in the course of my business and my connection with the First Edition Club in London, that there is an association between the identification with books, book collecting, book hoarding and book stealing, and sexual maladjustments. Identification with books... Even stealing books is only one of the many manifestations of the diversion of sex energy from its real purpose, that of normal sex relations and its use in inner development. Yet a man can still have ordinary sex relations with women and at the same time be too passive, especially if the feminine creative part of himself is strong. As I have said, Gurdjieff and his teaching develop the masculine in men and the feminine in women. His methods of treating psychological diseases were unorthodox and sometimes ruthless, but the cures were remarkable. Those with homosexual tendencies became masculine and lesbians became, as he expressed it, women mothers. With the profits from the sow, I bought a barn and some acres of land in Connecticut and there built a house, a more congenial occupation for me than book selling. Not long afterwards I was married. My wife had been at the Priory during its first two years, so we went abroad and spent most of the summer there. Gurdjieff was surprised, I think, and obviously pleased to see us. He began telling those around that we had performed a miracle, had squared the circle, as he expressed it. Round idiot had married square idiot. Behind his joking there was a world of meaning and much material for reflection. This summer was most interesting. Araj and some of the group of New York were there and Gurdjieff gave all his spare time from writing to working on us individually and collectively. In these few months were crowded years of activity and impressions. 
I remember little of his actual words, but I remember the strong impression he made, the way he manipulated us, mixed us up, his asides at meal times. His method brought about an eventual change in all of us, including Oraj. Each day we would meet and discuss what Gurdjieff had said, what he had meant. The results manifested themselves for me the following year and I will relate them in due course. The ritual of the Turkish bath was observed every Saturday and the lunches and dinners in the English dining room. Revised chapters of Beelzebub were read out in the salon and every day there was music. Instead of the rain of the summer before, there were weeks of bright hot weather. Several young couples were at the Priory. One day, as we were waiting for coffee in the salon, one of the newly married young women beckoned to her spouse and pointed to the empty seat beside her in no uncertain manner. And he, being the perfect American husband, immediately got up and sat beside her. Gurdjieff gave, not her, but him, a dirty look, and after a pause began to say that a man must not be a slave to a woman. He also spoke about the low status of American women compared with that in older countries because the men had relinquished their responsibility. He added, If you are first, your wife is second, but if your wife is first, you must be zero. Only then will your hens be safe. He then asked for some papers to be brought in and told someone to read the following. The Greek sage Socrates was a follower of this method, the method that Gurdjieff taught, and, in order to obtain shocks for evoking an intense manifestation of his inner struggle, he even looked for a corresponding wife, and having married her, he compelled himself to endure externally, patiently, for the rest of his life, the constant scolding and nagging of his Santipi. Some say that Gurdjieff often tried to provoke bad feelings between husbands and wives. It was not so. He tried to make them understand what a real relationship between husband and wife should be. I do not know of a single instance of married couples separating through Gurdjieff, but I do know of many who were brought closer together through him. His ways of dealing with people were always difficult and baffling, because unusual, but when it came to an understanding of the human psyche, Gurdjieff was always right. When immediate circumstances seemed to make him appear wrong, Later developments proved him right. Physical work was organised on a fairly large scale this summer. A tram line was laid by the side of the track through the forest and the grounds, leading from a stone quarry near the south gate. We wheeled tons and tons of large rocks and dumped them alongside the track, where we broke them up to make a road. One day, as I was working, a very strong feeling came over me that I must return to London at once. It was so compelling that I made no effort to resist it and went up to the house and gave the excuse that urgent business had called me to England. I left at once and reached London that night. It was too late to call on my dearly loved friend, Walter Fuller, as I usually did when I arrived in London. So I went on to Harpenden to spend the night with my parents. When I opened the Times the next morning, there was an account of Fuller's sudden death and a long obituary for he was well known in literary and journalistic circles and was then editor of the Radio Times. For several days I was numb with grief. When I returned to Fontainebleau after the funeral, Gurdjieff was very kind. He took me about with him and one day spoke about the importance of not giving way to grief. To do so is bad for oneself and perhaps bad for the one that is gone. One cannot help feeling real grief, which is very different from the pseudo-grief which people often indulge in. But one must try not to be identified with the suffering, but to use it. In doing so, one will help oneself and others. Gurdjieff often asked me to sit with him at the cafe while he was writing Beelzebub. At this time I was trying to set down the story of my travels round the world. One day I pulled out my paper and pencil and began to write. He stopped, looked at me and said, Ah, you will also write, and asked me what I was writing. I told him. He put down his pencil, flicked his moustache and said, If you write now, people will say you are ill man. Better you wait, then perhaps can write. I put the paper away, but the writing itch was strong and by degrees I finished the manuscript. It was no good and was properly turned down by the publishers. 
Years passed before I was able to get something accepted. Gurdjieff often staged scenes in order to give us shocks. It appears that Araj had told Gurdjieff that he would stay at the Priory for two months since, for reasons of his own, he had promised certain people in New York to return at the end of this period. As the time drew near, Gurdjieff tried to persuade him to stay, for he needed him to go over the English version of the chapter on America on which he was then working. Also, he liked to have Oraj near him, for few knew better how to joke and have fun with him without exceeding the bounds between master and pupil. Oraj's mind was more nimble than Gurdjieff's, and to be with these two was better than a play. Raj was always stimulating and, as Gurdjieff saw him, usually for only two months of the year, he made use of every possible moment to have him near him and to teach him, often when they were joking. It seems that Gurdjieff thought or pretended to think that he had persuaded Raj to stay. On the Sunday before he was due to sail, Gurdjieff organised a big party to go to Paris. After lunch, seven cars were ready in the courtyard with everyone waiting to start. As Gurdjieff was leaving his room, one of the women told him that Araj was sailing the following day. He came down to the courtyard and began to storm at Araj for leaving his work at the Priory and going back to non-entities in New York. The air became charged with electricity. Araj said nothing. Then, rather white, took his suitcase out of Gurdjieff's car and went to his room. In a few minutes, Gurdjieff followed him and a little later they both emerged, calm and composed, and got into the car. The cavalcade drove off and after a stop at a cafe arrived in Paris and went to Gurdjieff's favourite restaurant in Montmartre, La Crespies, or Madame Crayfish, as we called it, for dinner. Twenty of us sat down. We all stayed at the ho same hotel next to Gurdjieff's apartment and talked in Araji's room until early morning. He said that having given his essence promised return to New York, he was bound to keep it. Personality promise could be changed if necessary. An essence promise never. One day in Paris I met an acquaintance from New York who spoke about the possibilities of publishing modern literature. As I showed some interest, he offered to introduce me to a friend of his who was thinking of going into publishing and we arranged to meet the following day at the Select in Montparnasse. His friend arrived. It was Alistair Crowley. Drinks were ordered, for which of course I paid, and we began to talk. Crowley had magnetism and the kind of charm which many charlatans have. He also had a kind of dead weight that was somewhat impressive. His attitude was fatherly and benign, and a few years earlier I might have fallen for it. Now I saw and sensed that I could have nothing to do with him. He talked in general terms about publishing and then drifted into his black magic jargon. To make a success of anything, he said, including publishing, you must have a certain combination. Here you must have the master, here the bear, there the dragon, a triangle which will bring results, and so on and so on. When he fell silent, I said, yes, but one must have money. Am I right in supposing that you have the necessary capital? I, he re-asked. No, not a franc. Neither have I, I said. Knowing that I was at the Priory, he asked me if I would get him an invitation there, but I did not wish to be responsible for introducing such a man. However, to my surprise, he appeared there a few days later and was given tea in the salon. The children were there and he said to one of the boys something about his son, whom he was teaching to be a devil. Gurdjieff got up and spoke to the boy, who thereupon took no further notice of Crowley. There was some talk between Crowley and Gurdjieff, who kept a sharp watch on him all the time. I got a strong impression of two magicians, the white and the black, the one strong, powerful, full of light, the other also powerful but heavy, dull and ignorant. Though black is too strong a word for Crowley, he never understood the meaning of real black magic, yet hundreds of people came under his spell. He was clever, but as Gurdjieff says, he is stupid who is clever. Araj said about this, Alas, poor Crowley, I knew him well. We used to meet at the Society for Psychical Research when I was acting secretary. Once, when we were talking, he asked, By the way, what number are you? 
Not knowing in the least what he meant, I said on the spur of the moment, twelve. Good God, are you really? he replied. I'm only seven. During the summer, the idea had been arising in me that if my teacher, Gurdjieff, would tell me a certain something, a little secret, I would understand everything. Like the man in the fairy tales who is given free wishes and feels that everything is within his grasp, but he does not know what to ask for, and so wishes for the wrong things. It seemed to me that Araj, and especially Gurdjieff, were able to tell me something which would have made everything clear, instead of, as now, through a glass darkly and I found that this idea was shared by others. A young couple from the group in New York had been staying at the Priory. Twice they had said goodbye, and twice they returned. When they came back for the third time, I asked in surprise, why have you come back again? They said, Gurdjieff asked us, and we have been feeling that each time he will tell us what we want to know, and that he may tell us this time. And what do you want to know, I asked. That, unfortunately, we don't know. We only know we want to know. I spoke to Hartman about it, and he must have told Gurdjieff, for a day or so later, the draft of a chapter in the second series was read, Professor Skridloff. In the story, Father Giovanni speaks about the difference between knowledge and understanding. Understanding, he says, is the essence of that which one obtains from information intentionally acquired and from experiences that one has himself lived through, whereas knowledge is only the automatic remembrance of words in a certain sequence. Knowledge can be imparted by one person to another, but it is a hundred times easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for anyone to give to another the understanding formed in him by anyone whatsoever. He said that even if he wished to impart some of his own understanding to his beloved brother, he would not be able to do so. We wanted the understanding to which we were not entitled. We had yet to realise that understanding can be gained only by one's own efforts under the direction of a teacher. Autumn came early to Fontainebleau Avon this year and fires had to be lighted in our rooms in late September. In the evenings a log fire burnt brightly in the salon while Gurdjieff talked or Hartman played. We still practiced the dances in the study house, though there were no demonstrations. Life at the Priory was a paradigm of the patriarchal life. Gurdjieff, with his wife, mother, brother and sister with their families, children, nephews and nieces, pupils and friends, was the great patriarch. Name days and birthdays were remembered. It was a real man's life, an ideal for us men. As Araj said, we would all like to live as Gurdjieff does, but we have neither the guts nor the knowledge. Gurdjieff stressed the importance of having good relations with those of one's own blood, especially father and mother. A wife is different, not a blood relation. A man can have several wives, but only one mother or father. His self can even be affected by a bad relationship. He said to me, your father to you is like God, and you, through father, can become like God. An aphorism in the study house said, It is a sign of a good man that he loves his father and mother. In the chapter, My Father, in the second series, he tells that his father spoke of rules by which, if he kept up to the age of 18, young people can attain an inner freedom and prepare themselves for a happy old age. 1. To love one's parents. 2. To be chaste. 3. To be outwardly courteous to all without distinction whether they be rich or poor, friends or enemies, power possessors or slaves, and to whatever religion they may belong, but inwardly to be free, and never to trust anyone or anything. 4. To love work for its own sake, and not for gain.